What's going on, everybody? Maddie Wills checking back in for another episode of Wellbeing Wednesday with Maddie Wills, of course, brought to you by the fine folks over at Metro Health. And this week's episode, today's episode, an all too important one with the season that we're in. And of course, we'll get to that in just a second. First, we'll bring Dr. Munford into the fold as she's this week's guest. Hi, how you doing today? Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. And um, one of our first returning guests, if I if my brain is, is uh, remembering that right, but of course we spoke with you before and mm-hmm. we appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule uh, to just, you know, kind of hang out with us one more time. Um, before we get into this week's topic, which of course is mental well-being during an election season, uh, why don't you just go ahead and remind everybody about your, uh, your decades of experience and everything that you've been through to get to the point where you're at with Metro right now? Well, when you say decades, whew, yeah. <laughs> my bad, my bad. <laughs> it is decades. I will own that. Uh, my name is Dr. Tiffany Monford. I am the Interim Director of Clinical Services here at Metro Health Behavioral Health Hospital. I have been a psychologist for over 20 years, um, working with uh, clients, patients from childhood all the way up to geriatric both in inpatient, community-based settings, corrections, school-based, so pretty much everywhere. So I'm just excited to be here with you today. And we're excited to have you. So again, thank you for hanging out with us. And and today's topic is one that I'm going to use literally the advice you're about to give every day, because I'm in a different conversation with one of my family members, friends, or whoever, um, about everything that's going on right now. And of course, again, we're talking about Uh, this election year. So we all know that election season in general, but particularly these every four years uh, presidential election years, it can bring on a lot of stress. Um, So, you know, we'll get right to it. How do elections affect mental health in our community? I think the thing we have to recognize is that, yes, they're often linked to this stress response um, and just anxiety around what is going to happen, right? So, and this, this anxiety can lead us to have sleep problems. We may stay on high alert. Um, and this isn't new with this election season either. The American Psychological Association in 2018, because again, we're looking at kind of the, in that election year, said about 60% of Americans were regarding the political climate as being a source of stress for them. And around that time, this co- concept of election stress disorder was coined by a DC based psychologist named Steven Stosny, and he described this as these intense symptoms of stress and conflict that were happening in couples therapy, right? Because the couples are kind of dealing with their own um, issues around politics. And then we also know that we're seeing social media arguments. If any of us are on social media, you know you're gonna see it on your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter, which is now X, um, negative ads that are always showing up right now. Then that kind of incites these fears And then we're also in this 24 hour news cycle. So we're not even being able to kind of get away from the conflict that we're having. And so we're seeing this even increase from 2018, because in 2024, this year, the American Psychiatric Association did a mental health poll to kind of see where we were. And about 73 percent of Americans who responded were saying that they were feeling really anxious about Mm -hmm. this 2024 election. So this isn't stopping because we're getting that anticipatory stress from all of this kind of just being inundated from all sides, family, friends, TV, social media, with just kind of what is this going to turn out to be like? What are we going to expect? Yeah. And you know, that that unknown is Mm -hmm. where a lot of it comes from. Um, But then there's another side of it. So what are some ways to manage conflict when family and friends have strong opinions? Because when I alluded to in our in our open just now is that you know these are conversations that can get really tense mm-hmm. with people that you have a lot of love and respect for and you don't want to walk away from it you know feeling away but you know what are you, what are your suggestions for that I, I think it's one of the things that people are always saying is that it's easy to just walk away right but that's not easy right. um, because there's sometimes there especially in like political climates where there are issues on the ballot that are very personal they hit home for you and because you're personally impacted. So this idea of walking away from conversations where people are talking about an identity, an issue that really is going to affect you, you want to address it. You want to educate them. You want them to kind of see your point of view, but you also have to decide when is this futile? When is this not going to work, right? Because 
you have to recognize is that other person just not listening to you. Is the other person kind of saying, I'm playing the devil's advocate every time you're kind of bringing up this issue. And if you feel like you're spinning your wheels in the conversation, it's not serving you well. It's making you angry. It's making you frustrated. And so some of the things I recommend is that first decide if you have a common ground. Is, it, is there something that if we're going to have this conversation that we can actively listen to each other um, versus just everything is a trying to convince them of something else? We also have to say, what are the issues that I just that are so volatile, that are so strong and intense for me that it is unlikely to result in a true discussion? Like there's nothing you can say to me if you're on the opposite side of this that I'm able to hear. And then we have to reflect on that. Why do I keep bringing this up with this person? If I know there is no common ground, they're not going to hear me and I'm not willing to hear what they have to say. The difficult part, I think, sometimes is being prepared to be disappointed in that other person, especially if it's an issue that is so powerful to you that kind of hits home with your own identity. And what will it mean for your relationship, depending upon that? Is this something that we can agree to, to disagree on? Right. Because there are some things that we can say it matters to me but there's room for you not to totally agree. And there's other things that are just fundamental to my existence that we cannot. Um, and how is that, is that going to change the relationship if I can't get them to agree with me? What are you going to do with the information, right? If that agreement doesn't happen, if the conflict is happening, and do you even decide in that relationship that this is a subject that I want to touch? And so even beginning the conversation, we want to kind of set some parameters respectful discourse is what we talk about, right? Is this idea that we're really going to listen to each other. Right. Um, that I'm not going to call you out your name. I'm not going to threaten you. Um, I'm coming in there with a level of respect and we're going to try to have this conversation. But we also have to say, is there a point when we, be, we should be able to tap out that I can disengage? Um, because if it's getting to a point where I'm not listening and I'm you're not listening and it's just spinning those wheels, we probably need to stop. And then are there some things that we are leaving this conversation that we're going to agree on? And so you want to kind of commit to that and be open to truly listening if you can, because sometimes we come in just ready for our turn, right? Like we're double dutching and it's like, I'm just waiting to jump in versus really listening to what the other person is having to say, because sometimes we can find commonality in that. You know, my wife may or may not have said once or twice, are you listening to understand what I'm saying or are you just listening to respond? And I know a lot of times we can all be kind of caught in that mode where we're really just listening to mm -hmm. respond. But a couple of things that you said um, just stood out to me. Finding that common ground was important. Like, I, you know, I, I don't I don't think that I've ever mentally prioritized going into those kinds of conversations, looking to even find a common ground. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, when you when you argue about, you know, basketball fans, who's the GOAT, Michael or, or LeBron, mm -hmm. people really go into those discussions really not intent on changing anything that mm -hmm. they think and just trying to convey um, what, what they want to convey. So that may not be the best way to have those kinds of conversations, mm -hmm. especially with something that's so important as these elections. So, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Mumford, we'll get you out of here with this one. What are some coping skills to help reduce the stress caused by political news and social media? Well, the American Psychological Association in 2016 came up with some things that are helpful. So we'll start with those. Taking a break from the 24 hour news cycle, right? Because if we're the stress of constantly hearing it, um, constantly finding out the, the what ifs, especially if it's on the opposite side of your politics, you want to stay informed though, right? So we're not talking about cutting everything off because you need to be an informed person when you're choosing to vote, but don't go down the rabbit hole of every pundit that's out there that you either disagree with or agree with. You want to also spend time doing activities that relieve your stress. Um, because again, if this is a stress response, we're sitting here, we're not eating, we're not sleeping, we're having headaches, we're being irritable, we're being anxious. So you want to do some distraction techniques. And so some of these may be like spending time with friends or family not talking about politics though, setting this, we're not gonna talk about this at this moment because then if you're still talking about it, you're still putting yourself right back in the stressful situation. Taking a walk, um, watching non-political TV. Um, Dr. Shari Whitehead, she also talks about how can you begin to kind of reframe or restructure um, how you're thinking about things when you're getting anxious. And so this restructuring is to change these negative, these problem thoughts into more realistic ones. So for politics, she says, um, you may think the world is uncertain because of the election, and I'm afraid of what can happen. 
So she says, how about we change it to, I can fo focus on what I can control today, like supporting causes that align with my values. Mm. Or if you're worried about the political climate is making me really anxious, you can say, I can manage my anxiety by focusing on my self-care, setting boundaries, taking actions where I can be intentional and not letting it consume me. And so we also want to focus on what you can control because, you know, anxiety is just feeling somewhat out of control. So some of the things in this election cycle you can is you can do voter mobilization. Um, you can educate others about the election. You can donate your time or money to a candidate. Um, you can also take these moments to be present focused versus future election focused. So doing things that keep you present, meditation, prayer, breathing. Um, and then there's these ways to kind of look at the stressor. So problem analysis is you look at the problem, understand it, but don't think you can solve it by yourself. So sometimes we go into this election, your vote matters, you should get out there and vote, mobilize voters, so get your family out there as well. But you also know that you alone cannot fix this problem of whatever is going to happen. You also want to plan rehearsal, which is mentally practicing election related strategies. How am I going to deal with this? And we want to avoid this idea of stagnant deliberation, which is spending all your time thinking about what's gonna happen after the election or doing and doing that in more of that negative way and then outcome fantasy only for saying, I don't need to think about anything other than the fact that my candidate's gonna win so I'm not preparing myself in the future for how am I gonna deal with this if this doesn't turn out the way I want it to. Uh, you know, speaking to that mental preparation and just, mm -hmm. you know, putting your, um, your, your physical activities and the things that are, are taking you away from some of those mm -hmm. things that can be, you know, deemed as negative conversations. Uh, uh, a bunch of uh, great techniques and ideas that you just uh, listed. Uh, again, she's Dr. Mumford with uh, Metro Health. If you are watching this, and I like to remind people of this, um, if you're watching this and you know somebody who needs to, to see this or, or hear these words, please feel free to share the video. Of course, um, it'll live on the internet forever uh, and wherever you're watching or whichever one of our websites you're on. Um, just easily share it with whoever you think needs to see and hear this information. And also, you know, to our call to action this week is to talk with your primary care provider. If you're feeling overwhelmed or struggling to cope, you can call 216-696-3876 to make an appointment or visit metrohealth.org slash appointments. And if you're in a severe mental health crisis or contemplating suicide, please call the mobile crisis team at 988 or go to the nearest emergency room. Uh, again, you, you know, I'm going to say we'll see you next time, Dr. Mumford, because I'm hoping that we get to have another uh, conversation. And, you know, everything from the advice that you gave and just kind of um, peeling the curtain back a little bit to see why we do feel these feelings around this time of year. Um, it was very insightful and we appreciate you uh, hanging out with us. Thank you so much for having me again. Absolutely. That was another episode of Wellbeing Wednesday with Maddie Wills brought to you by the great people at Metro Health. And we'll see you soon. Thanks.